Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I suppose of the uh, presenters, apart from Tim, the one native English speaker, I have a terrible speech impediment. It comes from going to the wrong school and the wrong university. Um, but I have terrible difficulties with apostrophes and split infinitives as well. Um, to, to, to go, to, to, to start today, um, I did my 35 years with BP. And having done that, of course, I watched the events of April 2010 with um, great concern because a lot of my friends and close colleagues were involved in it. And that started me on a voyage of discovery, um, reading some of Sidney's book, James Reason's books. And really, um, I figured it wasn't a cement job. Um, it wasn't a technological problem. Like everything else, it probably was uh, just a bit of people and organization. Now, the non-technical summary is, uh, for me, there were some weak signals, and for whatever reason, uh, the team on the rig didn't, didn't see them. The management team in the office uh, didn't see uh, the weak signals. Um, there were some biases at work. Um, there, were, there was ambiguous information, and if you've got a choice between um, an explanation of something that says, if this goes wrong, all hell gets loose, and something that says, well, it's just a leaky BOP stack, you're probably going to choose a leaky BOP stack rather than hell about to break loose. Um, there were certainly, uh, you could see, well, why didn't they see the flow? Well, probably because they weren't expecting it. Maybe they weren't looking for it. And certainly, there is um, a feeling that, well, things just evolved, and uh, there might have been a, a degree of improvisation going on on the operation. And so the reading that I did, you eventually come up with um, Carl White Sutcliffe, high reliability organizations. I'm glad to see at least the phrase got a mention um, in the Maersk uh, diagnosis of the, the, the analysis they did post um, 2010. Uh, but essentially, for those of you who are not familiar with the work, uh, this is a very uh, quick summary. The, there's very rich literature around about this. But there are three attributes that um, go to create a high reliability organization to look forward to the unexpected. There is this preoccupation of failure. It doesn't mean that you've got to be worried about your barriers, but not so worried that you frighten yourself into uh, complete inactivity. But you've got to be concerned about barriers. You've got to be concerned about failures you can't um, rigorously explain. You've therefore got to take time out to explain them to yourselves. Um, certainly, you've then got to be very, very thoughtful about the operations under your control. It's not just enough to say, oh, well, this looks like so and so. You must analyze the data and really go into things in, in depth. And again, you see things like Tom Hanks playing um, mission uh, control in the Apollo 13 movie. And you look at the discipline that NASA had for analyzing and getting to the depths of problems. Uh, the other thing is that the organization has to be attuned to the reality of what's going on on the operation. But then, if the worst does happen, then you've got to have an organization that is resourced and strong enough uh, to deal with it. And certainly, when you are dealing with the unexpected, you need to make sure that when solving problems, you get the right expertise, the broad expertise, and you, you consult widely. You bring in people maybe with a contrary point of view, but you simply you have to get the diversity of view and the depth of expertise to solve the problem. So high reliability is easy to say. And what I struggled with back in 2011 and early 2012 was, what does this look like in a drilling operation? And it was almost a question of where, where, where do you start? Well, certainly, um, simple triangle up here. There is something about the leadership and the culture. And certainly what the oil industry was missing with its focus on slips, trips, and falls was 
it lost sight of, of the potential for catastrophic accidents. Therefore, the terms that we've heard this morning about process safety, we have to find some way of bringing a sense of uh, major accident risk alive I I in our operations team. Uh, certainly, we've somehow got to find and operationalize ways of making people uh, suspicious about barriers, but not cripplingly suspicious that they simply are afraid to do anything. And above all, we see that a lot of, com that a lot of organizational accidents come from the subtle pressures way back in the organization, time is money. Some of these uh, time is money pressures, they come from inside ourselves. The other part of the um, equation is definitely some things we've touched on this morning around uh, non-technical skills, the crew resource management. How do we make sure that people recognize the subtle human effects that are actually trying to trip us up? A and then the other part of it, which is when we go out into the operation, uh, a term operational uh, discipline, which has been talked about in various areas like, say, DuPont, um, you take the fact that none of the uh, Royal Naval or US Navy nuclear fleet have had a re reactor accident. You wonder why that is, but perhaps if you um, read uh, the literature, you find, well, you, it's easy to do this in a military environment because you can actually impose the discipline. So in the top part of that leadership, um, the the critical thing, look at thinking in terms of a bow tie, is what, what is it that we can do to sensitize the organization? Uh, is there a safety triangle that can tell us something about the health of our organization in relation to um, process safety? And so where we are now, um, there is a lot of thought going on in various companies to try and produce some safety metrics that will mean something and will bring um, process safety, major accident uh, risk management alive. Um, it was known about um, before Macondo. Uh, it was talked about extensively at Texas City, but as an industry, and certainly in the drilling community, we, um, we never really picked up on it. I think most people with a process safety background will be familiar um, with the conventional uh, occupational health and safety triangle, and the API 754 standard uh, tries to say, well, what are, um, what's, the, what's the analogous reporting uh, events that you might have in, um, in a drilling and wells, in a production process safety environment? The challenge we have is transferring that in, in a meaningful way into the drilling environment, because drillers don't just have blowouts, uh, they can capsize rigs, and I think uh, Lyndall Dew, the CEO of Diamond Offshore, had a has a very good way of focusing his organization on catastrophic risk. Everywhere you go in Diamond, uh, it's three sentences. It's keep the pointy end up, because remember, they were the company that had the Ocean Ranger disaster back off Canada. Keep the hydrocarbons where they belong, and don't give up the ship. And this, coming from the CEO, is a very powerful message. And leads the organization to think about catastrophic risk. But if we're looking at, so how do we engage well engineers? What are the performance metrics we need uh, at this tier three and tier four? This is where there's still much debate and much thinking going on in our industry. But my view is I've yet to see any conclusions. Few people have actually published anything about what performance metrics they're putting in there. But if we are to, energize and operationalize chronic unease, then we're going to have to start getting um, performance metrics around compromising of barriers, uh, crossing of uh, directional drilling anti-collision lines, or when perhaps our mud logging unit trips and uh, shuts down and we're left with just one set of instrumentation on the rig. These are challenges to our safety systems uh, because those are safety critical activities and we need to start measuring those. Uh, but at the bottom, there is this critical thing about operational discipline, and therefore we also do need to start having good conversations in our organizations about the number of dispensations we're granting, why we're doing uh, dispensations. Uh, we need to track the amount, of the, the number of uh, management of change, um, 
things that we pass through our systems. So there's a whole area around performance measurement that isn't being done at the moment. It is being talked about, but we, we need to get with it. Uh, on the bottom right-hand side of that triangle, the, 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 the human factors, the people side, um, there are a lot of biases that trip us up. It's the way we think. Um, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, the book, The Invisible Gorilla, uh, absolutely essential reading. Uh, it's not the stuff that rough, rough, tough drillers read, but it certainly is worth, um, even if you can't do that, looking at um, the video of The Invisible Gorilla. But there are these well-known biases. Uh, but my question for the audience, and maybe we can take this one afterwards, is how often when you read an inc incident report do you actually see words like confirmation bias or tunnel vision um, or framing of a question? Uh, the famous Mark Hayfley quote was he went into the meeting room and said, well, um, do we really need to have to run the, the cement bond log? So the leader's clearly given out the signal of what he expects, so is it a surprise that they didn't run the cement bond log? So really the question is, um, if we do have, or we do start talking about these biases in our incident reports, um, we've then got to say, well, you know, how then do we address them uh, proactively? And this is where we come back to aviation, uh, aviation had their Tenerife, well, their Macondo accident in Tenerife in uh, 1979, and um, they started down this trail of crew resource management. Crew resource management has um, since been through six major iterations. So there's a lesson. If we think that we're going to get human factors training in one go, uh, probably think again. I think uh, Maersk have made an excellent start. There are one or two other people who are beginning down this pathway, but I can confidently foresee um, really uh, s s some very interesting further ev evolutions um, before we land on, on something stable. But. What we found is in most high hazard domains, uh, these are the six uh, skills that uh, they've identified that will help us if we learn to develop these skills of situation awareness, structured decision making. These are the skills that will help us counteract uh, some of those uh, cognitive biases. But then the question will then arise, well, how actually should we train these non-technical skills? And again, we heard from Maersk uh, and what Maersk training are doing um, at Svenborg. This is just the beginning of uh, quite a long uh, pathway for the industry uh, because rough, tough drillers say human factors. And when you talk to drillers about human factors, they think of a bowl of petunias and bowls of flowers and touchy-feely stuff. But What's also interesting is that you get two messages from management. Um, sometimes when you start talking about this, management said, ah, oh, look, cut the psychobabble. Just tell us what we need to do. But my co-author, Margaret Crichton, um, she and her husband train responsible electrical persons in these non-technical skills for the operators in Aberdeen because they realized there were far too many electrical people electrocuting themselves, and often as not, not it was from a lack of situation awareness, um, uh, possibly a lack of teamwork, uh, maybe, a bit of, um, maybe a bit of stress. Um, but what she, what she and her husband have found very interestingly is that when you get the electricians in the room, they are really interested in the psychobabble stuff. And so you can see there's a little, nice little example here, perhaps, of management being overeducated in university degrees, patronizing the workforce. But they do find it compellingly interesting because when you talk to them about the biases, it begins that there's these aha moments when people, the penny begins to drop when they see why certain things have happened. It makes sense to them. They, they, they can explain it. So... This is our, our, our thought that if we're going to be um, teaching the non-technical skills, um, as Ron McLeod of Shell 
uh, says he's going on this campaign round shell to, up, to de help develop the sense, sense of chronic unease. And his, his first line is, right, everybody pay attention, sit up. This is difficult, so pay attention and get your brain around it. They then teach the psychological biases. Once you've taught the psychological biases, that's the why, you can then say the what, the non-technical skills are the countermeasures. Uh, then, as we heard this morning, combining theory and practice. Uh, but the other thing I think that um, Margaret and I are thinking about is that the latest generation of crew resource management, they've moved beyond non-technical skills. They're now talking about threat and error management. So uh, this is when you meet airline pilots, this is actually their mindset. And I think there's a threat and error management offers a huge um, opportunity for us because chronic unease is just this abstract term. I really don't want to get out of bed today, something bad's going to happen. But how do you operationalize chronic unease from a buzzword to practical, actionable steps? And when you look at the bow ties that we've done, when you look at the barriers that we've got in place, the, there in front of us, we, we've got our threats. But certainly in a day-to-day -day basis, going round the rig and saying, OK, what are the errors? Have we got a new mud logger on the rig? Has the driller just had a spat with his wife over the telephone? Uh, these are the things that may well induce errors that may uh, assist the threat to materialize. And Margaret and I were lucky enough to go and take a deep water frontier exploration well team, and we gave them just five afternoons. It wasn't anything in depth, there wasn't too much teaching, but it was as much as we could do. And this was a multicultural, the drilling manager was Bolivian, the wells team leader was Colombian, the senior drilling engineer was an Indian from Mumbai, uh, the drilling supervisor was Faye Peter Heed, and there was a very good mixture of, uh, of people, and they'd never worked together before. So actually just taking them through some of the non-technical skills, uh, giving them scenario-based exercises with a little dilemma, getting them to practice as a drill crew from the rig talking to the beach, um, we, we rung one or two interesting uh, knots out of the organization, including the fact that there's not too many Spanish speakers that can tell the difference between 14 and 40. So that was the human factors side, the bottom right-hand side of, of that triangle. Um, now, if I don't hurry up, Sydney's going to come along with a big hook and wheak me off into the wings. Um, the, but the other side of it is the operational control, the operating discipline. And again, I don't know how many of you are drilling engineers, drilling supervisors, tool pushers. Hands up. <laughs> One token driller. Right. Okay, not many, not many people know this. But actually, um, how you go from a drilling program to executable work steps on a rig is very rarely, if ever, written down. The procedures by which you monitor the operation are very rarely, if ever, written down. Because God, what everybody knows how it works. Everybody, we do this all the time. We know how to do this. Well, yeah, you get the diverse group that we had on that Wells project, and you find that, no, they don't agree. Um, do we know how we make decisions? Do we know who, at which level, makes what decisions? Uh, do we know what the immediate action rules are for the driller under which set of events? And above all, do we know whether people are, are competent to do this? Uh, so just to give you a quick picture, um, what this means in terms of a structure is you start with the geologist who produces a pack of lies. The senior drilling engineer believes it because he, he's always sold used cars by geologists. I'm oh, sorry, how, how many geologists in the room? <laughs> and so you get this drilling program, which is completely perfect. But what happens then is it goes out to the rig, and what good practice, I hesitate to use best practice because you get into trouble with lawyers for using the word best, but good practice is the company man and the tool pusher sit together, and they formulate a set of written work instructions. 
of course, if the drilling contractor has the luxury of a management system with a lot of procedures in it, then those procedures get incorporated into the written work instructions. Uh, the written work instructions are, um, or daily drilling instructions, they're what the uh, driller. Uh, this is an Indian driller working on a steam rig. That's where I started in 1973. He ended up as the managing director of the company. But basically, what's on the clipboard in front of the driller is these written work instructions. They are the step-by-step -step activities that go to the execution of the well. Uh, part of that pasted up in the doghouse is the immediate actions, what he does if the well flows, what happens if you get catastrophic loss circulation, what happens if the pump pressure behaves um, uh, um, unpredictably. And then, so you're drilling away and you have the instruments and the systems monitoring the well, and any deviations get discussed by the company man and the tool pusher, and if the deviations are outside their decision-making responsibility, they will go up to the loon for Peter Reed, um, for as a drilling superintendent, and, and if that's too big for him, it gets to Jorge the Bolivian. So that is actually how, in theory, the whole thing should operate. The interesting thing is that um, we were hearing about all these people doing good stuff on the rigs, and um, what, I, what the mental picture I was building was they're improvising. And what you find, and the challenge I would say is next time you do an incident investigation on a drilling operation, did they have the written work instructions? Okay, did they follow them? At what point did they not stop, what point did they stop following them? And what improvisations did they do thereafter? Because what you will find is you, that you can then ask, well, they weren't stupid, they weren't dumb, they weren't incompetent, they had perfectly good reasons for embarking on those in, in, improvisations. My challenge is, uh, be very interesting for you to find out um, why. Clearly, good practice would suggest you ought to uh, have a decision-making structure where you're absolutely clear about what the drilling manager does, and just a quick summary of the sort of decision rights that you may put at each level. But clearly, if you're going to do something that may compromise the well objectives, you've definitely got to go to the Hefe um, to get a sign off. And again, um, a busy slide, but this is the point. This is difficult. A lot of people assume they know this, but if you ask them to explain it, they don't. It's like draw a bicycle. It's, you, you're familiar with it, but you don't know it. And it is going to this level of detail. If you have a framework like this, you can train people, you can assess their competencies, and above all, you can then run a much more coherent operation. Just a couple of words um, about where we are with drilling contractors, because um, I do think that drilling contractors in general have a major role to play in making our industry safer. Um, the present interaction, Maersk probably accepted, focus on occupational health and safety. Uh, safety always comes first, doesn't really matter how slow the rig runs. Uh, very much a ma master-servant relationship, you call, we haul. Um, and generally a machinery operator, lack of appreciation of what goes on down hole. And I think that if you think about what actually has come out post um, Macondo, um, I'm sorry for the three-letter acronym, but indeed, I think it would be helpful for the industry, for drilling contractors to think, well, what is it in, how do they set their business up to move towards the ideal of high reliability? What is it about operational discipline, about following procedures? And however much the company man jumps up and down, screams and swears, they say, no, this is the procedure and we're sticking to it. Uh, how does drilling contractors institutionalize chronic unease? Uh, again, you saw Maersk a training in non-technical skills. But possibly more contentious, I, I think that the drilling contractor does need to take a skeptical look at the operator's drilling program, and if he doesn't like it, he should attack the drilling program at the time that the program's being signed off rather than when it comes to the rig. Um, I certainly think that um, drilling contractors should, took a, should take a more sideways look at the competence and the behaviors, because I think that um, Magnus' presentation this morning about the expectations of behaviors and safety leadership um, is a very important aspect, and when you look at some of the company men that go out and the damage that they can do, uh, there is a good point for, for everybody saying, well, does this company man engage with the 
rig team. So, in conclusion, and as I say, the, there is an SPE paper, for those of you, I've cantered over this very briefly, but the SPE paper on which this talk is based uh, is SPE 163489. It was presented at the Amsterdam conference a month ago, and it's there, So, and it's got a whole bunch of references that Margaret and I have collated. So if you do want a sort of quick read and a quick follow-up, um, the SPE paper 163489 um, is there to be read. So in conclusion, uh, wh where I am is that we do need um, to think about the human and social aspects. We've got to get our organization to a state where they are detecting and responding to weak signals and the workforce feel it's safe to do so. We've got to assure competence. It's not just where we got to sort of taken through a sheep dip. We've got to make sure, just like the airlines, that we have competence in non-technical skills. We've got to get much more disciplined about codifying and how we execute our operations uh, and then impose this discipline um, or encourage the discipline uh, at the workplace because in that way I think that an awful lot will come. Not only will our operations be less exposed to catastrophic risk, they will actually be safer from an operate occupational health and safety point, and above all, they will actually be more efficient. Thank you very much.